Hey everybody, I'm Natasha Kirchuk and thanks for joining us for ILTV's weekly program, One on One with Alan Dershowitz. We want to give you, our viewers, a chance to have your questions answered by Professor Dershowitz, one of America's greatest legal minds. He's a leading expert on criminal and constitutional law, civil liberties, and the Arab-Israeli conflict. Today we have a special edition of the show where we recapture the finest moments in commentary, bringing you the best of One on One with Alan Dershowitz. Well, today we're unfortunately beginning with some very disheartening news. 45 rockets have been launched at Israel from Gaza following a night of intense fire between the IDF and Hamas. At least five rockets fired from the coastal enclave landed inside Israeli communities near the border, and one even struck territory just outside of a kindergarten. The IDF claims they've struck about 25 Hamas military bases across the Strip in response to the rocket fire, claiming that the terror group is targeting Israeli civilians and dragging the people of Gaza down a deteriorating path. Hamas has responded by blaming Israel for the violence, saying the exchange of fire is all because of Israel now adopting the policy of targeting Hamas positions in response to kite and balloon-borne arson attacks. Joining us now is former Knesset member Av Shalom Vilan from the Meretz Party. And today, Vilan serves as the chairman of the Israeli Farmers Federation. And he has a question regarding the legal implications of Israel's response to such attacks. Go ahead. I think that uh, we are in a quite ridiculous situation. On the one hand, both sides don't want to have a full war in Gaza Strip, meaning that they are using, which is some kind of a primitive uh, rockets or kits and whatsoever. On the other hand, sometimes they are using the Qassam and even uh, most dangerous thing. But when we react, we don't react with all our full ability, military ability, because we know that we don't want to get into a situation of a total war between them. So how to find the balance and to stop it, uh, it's a very big question because from legal point of view, it's not from legal point. That let's say that Israel cannot allow that mm -hmm. our citizens will be attacked, and that they will try to cross the borders and will uh, attack civilians. No way. But on the other hand, the alternative uh, is not well also. So we are, as Israel, military forces, and the citizens over there just uh, spent the whole day yesterday over there. And uh, on the one hand, it's well known that we have uh, to stop it. On the other hand, whatever we'll do, we can escalate well, the well, situation. So the question here is, is, you know, Professor Dershowitz, the legal implications of taking lethal or using lethal force against those who are launching these kites. Talk to us about well, that. The, the legal issue is very simple. Uh, from a legal point of view, any act of war can be responded to militarily, and of course, an attempt to burn down fields is an act of war, a casus belli. And there is no rule. There's a lot of misunderstanding about this. There is no rule about proportionality of response. The only rule of proportionality is when you attack a target, there must be proportionality between the number of civilians killed and the importance of a military target. But if there's any act of war, even a small act of war, the response can be massive retaliation. So legally, Israel is entitled to militarily respond to kites that burn fields. And they don't burn empty fields. You know, they burn food. They burn resources. It's an environmental disaster. We're not hearing a word from environmentalists around the world who should be condemning Hamas uh, uh, for this. Just because it doesn't kill any Israelis yet doesn't mean that Israel has to accept the burning of its food supply, the burning of its gardens, the burning of its trees. It has militarily the right to respond. Now, it can't respond by disproportionately killing civilians. It has to pick targets that are military targets. But for the most part, what I've seen is that Israel has picked military targets. So the decision is not a legal one. It's a tactical one. It's the one pointed out by our guest. And that is, if Israel doesn't want to uh, engage in a full-fledged war, that's a tactical decision. And it has to figure out how to strike the appropriate balance. But military, but legally, it's on completely sound grounds. It is entitled to use lethal force, military force, against combatants if these combatants are trying to burn down Israeli uh, fields and farmlands. 
Well, joining us now in the studio is a very special couple. Taylor Amrani and Achia Klein are dedicating their lives to advocating for the state of Israel and the Jewish people. Both served in the Israeli Defense Forces and then met at the Algov Ambassadors Program at the Herzliya Interdisciplinary Center here in Israel. So, Achia, why don't you start out with telling us a little bit about your personal story? So, uh, let's just you say, my name is Achia Klein. I'm originally from uh, Kfar Etzion, they're in uh, Gush Etzion, small uh, religious kibbutz. Um, so in the army I was in uh, Yalom. Uh, Yalom is a special engineer unit, combat engineer unit. And um, I, I, after, after I, got, I, I, went, I went to officer school and uh, later on I get injured in, in one of our mission to demolish a uh, terror tunnel. It's uh, before a protected age. Um, after I get injured, I, uh, my life is changed a little bit because mm -hmm. I lost my eyesight. And then I decided that I want to do more advocacy um, to talk about Israel. And uh, I do it in, in, in a few, in a few, uh, in a few way. Um, Today I compete with the Israeli Paralympic rowing team, so wow. to, to uh, meet a lot of uh, crew with uh, a lot of uh, country and to speak with them in, in, inside the competition, in a training camp, to understand, to understand, uh, to let them understand about Israel. And uh, also I give a lot of uh, exploration talk and uh, let people to understand the complicity and also how I deal with my situation and uh, and what you've been through. Yeah. Yeah. What I've been well, through. well, it's interesting because you know you would think that somebody who goes through such a traumatic experience might not necessarily be, be the biggest fan of the state of Israel, but you have now been dedicating your life to kind of tre changing the world image about this country. Um, how how did that happen? How how did you become aware that this was something that you wanted to be doing? Um. Actually, I don't know. I, 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 it's just something for me, from inside, and tell you, you have to do that. You have to, to go, to stand up, to fight on Israel, because before I do it in the army, defend our, our border, and now I get the opportunity to do it in other, in other mm -hmm. ways. So it's, for me, it's kind of a present to, to keep doing what I used to, to do before. Absolutely. And it's so necessary. It's so essential. Uh, Hia, you're really a hero. You were a hero both on the battlefield and you're a hero in the court of public opinion. It's so important. Today you have people uh, all over the world preaching hatred against Israel and the Jewish people and Zionism in schools, uh, in, in Riverdale uh, School, uh, the Riverdale Country Day School in Westchester, New York. You have teachers who are screaming at students, saying that Israelis are all terrorists and that uh, Zionism is uh, a form of racism. Uh, you have uh, the Beacon School in New York, where they had a moment of silence only for the dead of uh, Gaza, but not ever for uh, Israelis who have been uh, killed. On colleges and university campuses, I can't even come and make a speech, and I'm a very moderate supporter of the two-state solution and end of the settlements and occupations. Uh, within security for Israel, and I get booed and called a Zio fascist, and people are just not willing to uh, listen to the case for uh, Israel. So you and I have that in common. I wrote the case for Israel. You are making the case for Israel, and we need young people and people who have really experienced what you've experienced to make the case. So I hope when you come to America, we can meet, and maybe we can be on a platform together at a university campus in which you can tell your story. I, that's, it was my pleasure. <laughs> yeah, that's an amazing opportunity. Yeah. Now, now Taylor here, um, she's actually recently launched launched a page on Facebook, mm -hmm. and she is also uh, a pro-Israel advocate, uh, advocate for the Jewish people. Let's take a look at her page first before we discuss this. Why? Why do these people have a lack of basic resources? After so much money that they're given, why don't they have a stable and functioning society? The answer is Hamas. When you start to care about Gazans only when the Gazans have pictures of dead babies on the cover of the news, what you're doing is giving Hamas a reason to kill more children. I'm years old, I'm a proud Israel Zionist Arab Muslim. I came from a Gazan father, a Palestinian father who grew up in Gaza. And I still remember how my father told me what Hamas did when they got the authority, how they killed children only because they support human rights and only because they want peace. It's so much harder to build a stable society than to just sh 
throw people at a fence and send them with weapons to kill themselves. But that's what you are doing. New York Times, CNN, European Union. You are incentivizing victimhood. You are killing Gazan people. Why did you say that you consider Israel's army one of the most moral ones in the world? A lot of people who think they understand Israel probably will never visit Israel or meet an Israeli or a former IDF soldier in their life. And it's just amazing to see how effective it can be when you meet these people face to face and they can ask you questions. Wow, wow, that is fantastic. Please send me a link to that and I will circulate it on all of my lists. It's a terrific, terrific piece of work. And you're so absolutely right that uh, I've said this before. Every Gaza civilian who was killed accidentally by an Israeli bullet, the legally and morally the responsibility is with Hamas, who sent them to the front using what you and I both call the dead baby strategy, knowing full well that the CNN, the Times, uh, will carry pictures of the dead babies without explanations that it was Hamas who paid parents money to use their children as as martyrs and making that message and sending it out and having a phenomenal young woman like you uh, on the Facebook page will have an enormous impact. So uh, you too, when you come to America, uh, let's work together and let's go on college campuses and let's tell them the truth, emet, veritas. Uh, the truth is what we want. We don't want propaganda. We want just the truth because the truth is the best support for Israel. All right, so things recently got a whole lot more royal here in Israel. Prince William uh, recently touched down in Israel, kicking off a historic visit to the country. And this was the first time in Israeli history that a member of the royal family came to the Holy Land on an official state visit. But as per British policy, the trip was actually explicitly non-political. And joining us now is international human rights lawyer Arsen Ostrovsky, who also serves as the executive director of the Israeli Jewish Congress. So, Arsen, why now? Look, first of all, I think we have to reiterate this has been a truly historic visit. Um, it's been 70 years, and in this time, the British royal family has visited almost every country on Earth, especially and including all the Arab countries. The one anomaly has been the failure to date to visit Israel. And that's, I think, due to a number of factors, uh, including reluctance from the British Foreign Office, um, the British allegiances with some of the Arab allies. <coughs> but I think also... Uh, you know, we've taken into account British history with Israel before the founding of, of the state. Right. But now we've seen the last year a number of key factors change. We've seen the British exit from the EU. We've seen 70 years of Israel's independence. Just last November, we marked 100 years of the Balfour Declaration. And this year is 80 years of the kinder transport um, anniversary as well. So I think a lot of those factors have uh, played, played together and we're seeing much stronger relation between mm -hmm. Israel and the UK. So I think it was an opportunity to finally uh, put an end to this great injustice and to finally have a, an official royal visit to the Holy Land. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Now, Well, yeah. hope also it's a function of the government recognizing that they have a deep, deep problem uh, with Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, the first time a leader of a major party is as anti-Israel and morphing into anti-Semitism as they have today, and I would hope this is intended to send a message that uh, opposition to Israel's existence and the kind of garbage that Jeremy Corbyn and some of his people spew about Israel doesn't reflect the attitudes of the royal family or the people of Great Britain. Now, not long before this visit, senior Trump administration officials Jason Greenblatt and Jared Kushner were in the Middle East to consult regional governments on their Israeli-Palestinian peace plan. Now, their secret deal has yet to be revealed to the public, but it already looks like Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas is giving them the cold shoulder here. Now, Arsen, I know that you have a, qu a question regarding this yeah. specific issue for the professor, so go ahead. Sure. Look, I mean, uh, Professor Dershowitz, I mean, I'm hopeful that you might shed some uh, some insight and some light into uh, the moment what I think very few people know. We keep hearing about this peace process being unveiled at any moment now. We know that Kushner and Greenblatt were here, but we also know that the Palestinians flatly rejected meeting them. And we know that, um, you know, the Palestinians are still pursuing unilateral actions at the UN. They're still in contravention of the Taylor Force Act and so on. So I'm curious, you know, what one, what can we expect from this uh, peace plan? And two, I mean, what... Uh, you know what what it can achieve given the recalcitrance from the from the Palestinians and already their rejection of the plan before it's even been uh, released. 
Well, uh, as you know, the public uh, information indicated that I did spend a couple of days in the White House conferring with uh, Greenblatt and with Kushner about the, the proposed uh, a peace uh, plan. Um, I think uh, it will be a positive plan. I think it will be a good plan. I think the first point is I hope Israel accepts it. And I hope that uh, the Israeli political figures don't allow politics to trump uh, a, a statesmanship. This is something the Israelis should embrace and embrace in a unified, nonpartisan way. And then the goal is perhaps to get the Sunni Arabs on board as well, particularly the Gulf states, uh, Jordanians, the Egyptians. Uh, and if the end result is that the Israelis accept the plan that the Sunni Arabs uh, accept, but the Palestinians reject, that would be a big, big plus for Israel. It would show the world again that Israel is prepared to make the kind of painful sacrifices that Benjamin Netanyahu has said are required for peace. It is also possible that if the Sunni Arabs are united in support of a peace plan, that it would pressure the Palestinians to, uh, to accept that. Uh, people are growing tired of the Palestinian refusal and of them making themselves the center of all these issues. We're seeing in Iran now, there are demonstrations against the Palestinians. We're seeing it in other parts of the uh, Sunni Arab world. The entire world is getting sick and tired of the Palestinians always saying, no, no, no. They said no in 1947. They said no in 1938. They said no in 1967. They said no in 2000, 2001. They said no in 2008. Palestinians are not going to get a state at the United Nations. They're not going to get a state at the International Criminal Court. They're only going to get a state by negotiating it one-on-one -on -one with the Israelis, with the support, hopefully, of the United States and the Sunni Arab countries. So if Israel accepts the plan and the Sunni Arabs accept the plan, it's already a win-win for peace, a win-win for Israel. And one only hopes that the Palestinians will be pressured as well to accept the plan. Let's begin with the story that's actually dominating the world news. It's, of course, the recent summit in Singapore between U.S. President Donald Trump and North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. Trump seems to think the meeting went well, but let's hear directly from him. Chairman Kim and I just signed a joint statement in which he reaffirmed his unwavering commitment to complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. We also agreed to vigorous negotiations to implement the agreement as soon as possible. So, Professor Dershowitz, what is your take on these developments? What are the implications for America, the world, and obviously, um, how is this going to affect our region in particular here in Israel? Well, I think, first of all, as President Trump has said, he's not going to rely on paper promises. Uh, President Clinton relied on paper promises. President Bush relied on paper promises. They were broken, uh, and um, one has to see action on the ground, as my grandmother would put it, tachlis. We have to see real, real action on the ground, make sure that there's really denuclearization and that the um, negotiation succeeds. Uh, the same thing, of course, is true with Iran. Uh, parchment promises won't do. Uh, uh, paper promises won't do. Deals, uh, uh, the words of deals don't carry a lot of weight with tyrannical regimes like North Korea and Iran. And so, we'll have to look to see whether uh, there is real action. Uh, look, President Trump has his own style. Uh, he has been a negotiator for many, many years, and he has achieved success in the business world. I have an open mind as to whether his tactic will succeed in this uh, much more difficult world. I hope it does, and I hope it sends a powerful lesson to uh, Iran that denuclearization of Iran would also uh, have an enormous amount of benefit for the Iranian uh, people. It would eliminate the American sanctions. It would permit the countries to establish somewhat closer uh, relations. Uh, Iran, of course, is an evil uh, regime, not only because of its nuclear ambition, and it indeed has nuclear weapon ambition, but because of its hegemonic interests in the entire Middle East, including the Gulf states and uh, other areas. Uh, and its uh, willingness to build a Shia crescent from Iran through Iraq, through Syria, uh, through Lebanon, and even to the Sunni uh, areas of uh, Hamas. So it's very important that their exportation of terrorism stop as well. 
And I hope that President Trump takes on the Iranian situation uh, vigorously next. Um, I think the deal that was made by the Obama administration was a green light to uh, establishing nuclear a weaponry in Iran after uh, eight or 10 years, which is the blink of an eye. And I think there has to be no sunset provision and absolute assurances that Iran will never, under any circumstances, seek to acquire or develop nuclear weapons, as it said it would not in the prologue to the deal itself. So open mind, let's wait and see. Good first step. Can you make any predictions as to how you think Iran um, will end up reacting to, to this conversation, this meeting, this you know, so-called denuclearization of North Korea? Well, I think it probably um, is, is can, taking it under consideration. Uh, I think the only way Iran will end its nuclear ambitions, if it's told in unequivocal terms by the Americans, the Israelis, and hopefully the international community, that's probably hoping for too much, that it will never, under any circumstances, be allowed to acquire a nuclear arsenal. If it really believes that that's true, and that in the end, military force, if it has to be used, will be used to prevent the nuclear weaponization of Iran, if it becomes convinced of that, then it will give up its program and try to end the sanctions and develop a, a stronger uh, economic base. But if it still thinks that the world will allow it to develop nuclear weapons in eight or 10 years, then there's no reason for it to give up that ambition because that will help it control the entire Middle East. And what we're seeing now is the Middle East uh, ambitions of two non-Arab countries trying to control the entire Arab world, and that is uh, Turkey and Iran. Uh, Iran is a truly villainous uh, country, and Turkey is moving toward the Iran model uh, quickly, uh, though it's a member of NATO, but not a particularly uh, good member of NATO. And so I think Israel has uh, deep concerns, uh, concerns that transcend the Israel-Palestine conflict, but that also focus on the two non-Arab Muslim superpowers in the region. That wraps up this edition of One on One with Alan Dershowitz. If you'd like Professor Dershowitz to answer your questions, go to ILTV.TV or our Facebook page and submit them. We'll see you again next week.